Well, many times throughout history, the Lord would unveil himself through one of his names. He'd show his nature through one of his names, as he did with Abraham. He revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That's, that's when he was sacrificing his only son and God provided the sacrifice. He was Jehovah Jireh. He also revealed one of his names to King David in First Chronicles. In this situation with David, he needs an extraordinary breakthrough. And the Lord revealed himself as Baal Perazim. And that means the God of the breakthrough. Anybody need a breakthrough in here today? Hallelujah. The God who breaks through. When Jesus was baptized in water in Mark 1, the Bible described what actually happened in the unseen world at his water baptism. It says that the heavens parted, but the word used here is a violent term. Heaven ripped open. The same word used when the rock split open at the death of Christ. The same word when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. There was a breakthrough. The New Living Translation says, the heavens splitting apart. The CSB says, the heavens being torn open. So when the Bible says, the heavens open, something happened on heaven's side that completely tore open and obliterated the powers of darkness that shield, shielded humanity from its purpose, from their destiny. When Jesus came up out of the water, the Spirit of God had been released through what had been torn open. On that day, there was an even greater realization of what was declared at the beginning of Jesus' life and his ministry. It's important, important for us to take these comments that are sometimes only acknowledged at Christmas time. It's great, we got the Christmas trees up. I'm gonna give you a Christmas verse. Amen. They and realize that this really describes the normal life of the follower of Jesus. His introduction to the world, Jesus, at his birth, came with this decree in Luke 2, 13 through 14, New King James. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill toward men. It's always been designed that that reality of that world would affect this one. Not just occasionally, not just when we're praying for a miracle, not just when we come here to church and we're singing and it feels so good, not when we're having a revival meeting, but it's a lifestyle. Glory to God in the highest. That realm of him being exalted is to affect this realm. On earth, peace and goodwill toward men, amen. The word peace is one of the most pregnant words in the Bible. It deals with spirit, soul, and with body. Peace is not the absence of noise. How do I know this? Have you ever sat alone just in the quiet or in the dark and you're thinking, I just need some peace and some quiet? You turn everything off, you can turn the lights off, but guess what? You can still have those thoughts that the enemy shoots in there that you gotta cast down. Peace is not the absence of noise or the absence of conflict or war or the absence of difficulties. It's a word that describes the presence of someone, the presence of the Prince of Peace, the one who crushed the powers of darkness under his feet so that peace resting on us is the assurance, the guarantee that we will trample on the powers of darkness. Who could use some of that? Amen. The God of the breakthrough is here. Amen. One of the worst lies that the enemy has worked into our culture and society is that there are situations, that we can have situations that are hopeless. You know, there's never been a time that I know of uh, that I've seen in our culture, whether it's political, ecological, having to do with the economy, it doesn't matter. There seems to be prevailing voices that are filled with hopelessness. In many cases, hopelessness, hopelessness is a de demonic spirit that has attached itself to the thought processes of people that are void to the God of the breakthrough. They don't know the God of the breakthrough. 
Go to Isaiah 51, verse 12. There, these verses should be up here. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's there. Praise God. This is such a great verse. Isaiah 50, 51, verse 12, the New King James says, I, even I am who comfort you. Who are you to be afraid? Wow. Did you get that? He said his name twice. He said, I, I am who comfort you. Who are you to be afraid? Who do you think you are? For, for are we to fear when we know the one who comforts us? The almighty creator God, our father? Turn to Romans 8, 18. We have nothing to fear when we know who loves us, amen? In a, we're gonna stay in Romans 8 for a minute. In Romans 8, it's the announcement that there's no longer any condemnation. And we know that we have the privilege to enter into this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And we get to learn about a victorious, what a victorious life is all about. In Romans 8, 18, the Amplified, you there? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us, in us, and for us, and confirmed on us, amen? Hallelujah, Mark Hankins, when he was here, he called the glory the heavy. I like that, I like that. You know, it says in the Bible that when the glory filled the temple, all the priests fell down and they couldn't even minister. It was the heavy, the weight of his glory, amen? And this is what's revealed to us, in us, for us, and confirmed, conferred on us, amen? If you're in a present time suffering, in opposition, persecution, difficulty, pressure, just say to yourself, this is so small. This is so small compared to the glory that's about to break loose, amen? Come on. It's not even worthy of comparison. It's not even worthy to be compared. It doesn't mirror in darkness what glory mirrors in light. It's not even worthy of that comparison. Then down a little bit further in Romans 8, 24 through 26. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Amen, that's an important word. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself, say the Spirit himself. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Groanings that cannot be uttered. The first time I ever heard that was in LA, Jeannie was groaning. She had Holy Spirit groanings. I was like, what is that? Amen? Amen. Yes, groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit is the great intercessor, and he intercedes for you by name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All prayer, prayer is legal. You can complain. You can whine. You say, God, I don't like that. It's because he's patient. But the most effective prayer is when we pray with the Holy Spirit. That includes in tongues, but it also includes praying with understanding. An anointed prayer can be prophecy. When someone prays the word of God over you, that's God's word. When someone prays an anointed word, they are announcing what is about to happen. That happens every Sunday up here. We've got prayers and people come. And they need prayer, and people get in the word. These, people, these prayers, they know the word of God. They pray the word of God over these people, and they are announcing the victory. They are announcing what is about to happen. Amen. Incredible things happen in prayer. Uh, we, were, we had a class in Bible school. I told first service uh, in Bible college, we were doing a class on prayer, and I was in the back over there, and, and we were just praying and praying, and everybody was praying in tongues, and I was back there just I have to go back there because I get a little loud. You guys, you, I know you guys don't believe that, but I can get a little loud. And so I was praying back there in the corner, and then all of a sudden inside I heard God say, go pray for that person. I said, okay. And then I said, God said, wait. I heard wait. I'm like, wait. 
I'd never gotten wait before. I never got go and then wait. So I'm waiting. I'm okay, God. So I just started praying again. And as I'm back there, a couple minutes went by. And then, okay, now go pray. I told, I told a buddy about this just the other day. So, so then um, uh, I went. And I went over there. And I got there. You know, didn't, I just prayed what came up inside. I don't even remember what I said. But I got right next. They were praying quietly. They were over there. And I prayed in the ear. And I said what I believe God told me to tell that person. And then I went and sat down. That was on a Monday night. On Sunday, they caught me in the hall. Pastor David, Pastor David, I have to tell you something. I said, what's that? And she said, I was sitting there, and I was praying. And I had just said, Jesus, do you even see me? You know what I told her? The minute, she, I didn't remember. She told me. She said, remember what you said? I said, nope. She, the minute that she asked, Jesus, do you even see me? The first thing I said was, Jesus sees you. He is so good, amen. Amazing things happen in prayer. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then the third type of prayer here is the groanings. You, can e you can't even find words or tongue. Tongues doesn't seem to meet that need. It's the travail of heart, and it's the anointed Holy Spirit prayer. He translates that groaning of the heart into spiritual breakthrough. Hallelujah. Verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's one of my favorite verses. You could put that on a mirror. You could put it on the refrigerator, right? Such a good verse, amen. Why is that verse in the Bible? Look at that real quick. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Because sometimes there is a waiting time between the promise and the fulfillment. Amen. What do you do in the waiting time? Someone said it's like rooms in the house from glory to glory, but it's hell in the hallways. This verse is because God is not a vending machine that we put something in, press a button, and you get your answer. He's a relational father that we walk through life with to discover kingdom breakthroughs in every aspect of our life. I'm so thankful that some of my prayers are answered so quickly. Sometimes, like, like he knew I was about to pray. It's like, oh, God, can I? Oh, wow, look at that. Praise the Lord. Many times he answered. They, they happen. But there's other times that some prayers take years. Why? I don't know why, but I don't need to know. All that matters is that I remain faithful to the one who has promised and make sure that I protect my heart of hope where it is always anticipating good. Amen? I refuse. I refuse to have one issue in my life that I hold God, God hostage to. I refuse to have one thing that I say that if God is really the God of miracles, then this thing will be answered or solved. Because I don't know his process. I know his heart. I know his will. I know that cancer is supposed to be healed. I know his heart. I know that the, this family is supposed to be restored. I know his heart. I know this business is supposed to succeed. I know that. I don't question his heart for this situation, amen? But when I hold him hostage to the answer that I expect, what I do is I restrict myself from entering into the realms of breakthrough over so many areas of my life that I'm actually facing. Sometimes the Lord wants to create a momentum for this thing that I hold so dear. He wants to create a momentum of breakthrough through other circumstances so that I have the courage or then I have the faith so that I can persevere in this one thing that I would typically hold him hostage to, amen? How about David? How about when David fought Goliath, when he killed Goliath? What happened first? He built momentum, he killed the lion. He killed the bear. So then when he went to King Saul and no one would fight Goliath, he says, I killed a lion and I killed a bear and this giant's gonna fall just like them. 
there was a time that I was at, at work. I work on an Air Force base, and um, there's this incredible man, two-time Purple Heart Award, and um, I found out he wasn't at work for a little while. He was an engineer, and I found out that uh, he had stage four cancer. He was getting chemo. The doctor told him that he wasn't going to make it. He came back to work because he loved his work. And he said, yeah, he, he, I said, man, I did, I, we found out at a meeting and I took him outside on the main road of the base. And I said, man, I had no idea. I had no idea. And, and I'm just like, I feel so bad for him because he just said, the doctor said he's not gonna make it. And then inside I heard, pray for him. The guy's supposed to die. And God says, pray for him. And I'm on the main street of the base with all these cars driving by. And he said, pray for him. But do you know what? I prayed for other people before, and they've been healed. It wasn't stage four cancer, and it wasn't somebody that the doctor said was going to die, but I prayed for other people before, and they had been healed, and there had been a momentum. And I said, okay, God, if you want me to pray for him, I prayed for him right there. Guess what? He's healed. He's healed. There was a momentum that was built up. Amen. Praise God. This verse is here for the hell in the hallway. It's here for the seasons in between breakthroughs. It's in here so we can sink our teeth into it and feed on it in between the breakthroughs. Go down to verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Did you hear that? I'm going to say that again. For him he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Say this with me. I have been predestined to be like Jesus. There are no other options. That's his word. That's his plan. Amen? There's no plan B. Now that you've been predestined to be like Jesus, how long is up to you? Verse 29. Again, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first among many brethren. This is an important thought here. All of our hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus. Paul teaches elsewhere that if there is no resurrection, there is no hope. Picture this. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead took up residence in you, in me, when we were born again. Amen? When we, when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we became born again. The exact spirit, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen? All of that power lives in you. Well, what does that do? Several things. One is that it connects me to eternity. And our hope is anchored in eternity. It's anchored in the eternal the. E it's anchored in the eternal future of absolute perfect peace with God forever. And that deposit is the spirit of God. It is actually the down payment for my ultimate inheritance. Amen. To live without hope is to deny eternity with God. I'll say that again. To live without hope is to deny eternity with God. It's vital for us to guard our heart, to maintain a heart of hope. Why? Because it keeps us aware of this eternal promise, amen? Hallelujah. When I'm aware of my eternity, what's the worst thing that can happen? I could die and things would get 10,000 times better, amen? Can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> but I'm not talking about heaven as an escape place. It's our present tense home. I'm to live from there, from heaven towards earth now. And that realization keeps me at a place where my soul is anchored in joyful anticipation of what is good. We need an increased revelation of eternity, amen? Because it is the reality that keeps us anchored in hope, regardless of what goes right, regardless of what goes wrong. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. We're justified by faith when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. 
glorified is past tense here, isn't it? Can you imagine the resurrection, erected Jesus being intimidated by a problem? Can you imagine him looking at a situation that you created for yourself and he thought, hmm, never saw that coming. No, he's God. Amen? But it says here that you are in Christ, and according to the scripture, you have been glorified. Amen. I want to show you something. John, the beloved, the disciple that Jesus loved, I like that. I don't know if you've seen The Chosen. I liked it uh, on The Chosen. John is talking to Mary, and he says, he loves me. And she says to him, he loves all the disciples. You just have a need to talk about it more. <laughs> but that was his, re his revelation of what Jesus' love was, amen? John saw Jesus as he was being betrayed. He saw him as he was being crucified. That John saw him some time later, and he wrote about it in Revelation chapter 1. And when he wrote about it, he said, his hair is white like wool. His eyes are flaming fire. His feet are burnished bronze. He describes something that is completely different than the Jesus that he saw at the Last Supper. He saw a resurrected, ascended, glorified son of God. And then he wrote these words. As he is, so are we in this world. The hope is not in who I am. The hope is in who he is in me. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? Is, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Amen? Amen. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I'm gonna read that again. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Somebody say all things. Here's how you look at it. You have a problem. Whatever it is you're facing, we're all facing something, some kind of a pressure. Put it in front of you, and then look at the extreme lengths that God made sure that you'd be okay. He gave his one and only son. He paid the highest price to take care of whatever this thing is, amen? I don't care how big it is, it falls deeply under the shadow of his extreme extreme expression of interest, desire, and passion for every single detail of your life. He cares about every single detail. Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. So we have Jesus in, th in verse 34 interceding for us. What does intercede mean? It means that he stands in my shoes. He stands in your shoes pleading our case before the Father that I might have a breakthrough. Amen. And then we already read this back in verse 26. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you, for me. Amen. Amen. He stands in our shoes pleading our case before the Father. Not that the Father needs to be persuaded, but because of the chain of events, there needs to be a prayer that causes a tipping point. The Holy Spirit and the Son of God together intercede for you and for me. No wonder we have that verse, verse 28. All things work together for good. Why? Because we have two-thirds of the Godhead interceding on our behalf. The Son of God with the Holy Spirit is interceding for you and me. Come on, we can get excited about that. All things work together for good, amen? In the middle of the mystery, all things work together for good. I've heard it said like this, all delayed answers are merely gaining interest. Hallelujah. They're gaining interest. They're gaining presence. They're gaining power. They're gaining a meaning and a fulfillment. Faith brings answers, but enduring faith 
brings answers with character. Roy was talking about that during the offering, character. Why? That's what he's forming in us. Why? He told us, I have predestined you to be like my son Jesus. Jesus illustrated what perseverance looked like. Jesus illustrated how to hold course no matter how many applauded him or no matter how many opposed him. Isaiah 51, verse 12 again, New King James. I, even I am who comfort you. Who are you to be afraid? Everywhere you look in the world, the enemy has raised up the voices of hopelessness, but it's not right. It's not kingdom. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Peace, that prevailing substance of the atmosphere of heaven. Peace that engulfs an an individual's life where it tames every bit of opposition that surrounds them. It's the Prince of Peace that crushes the powers of darkness under our feet, amen? The same anointing, that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. I, even I, am who comfort you. Who are you to be afraid? In John 15, verse five, in the Amplified, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. Hallelujah. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Man, that throws out so many things that I've done in my life. So many things that I've done this before and I know how to do this. I've, I'm good at this thing. I don't need to ask Jesus. You know, one of the most inspiring stories to me is um, when David had many victories fighting the Philistines. And he, he asked the Lord, he was already a mighty warrior and defeated him many times and he asked the Lord and said, should I go up and should I fight? Will we, will we win? And God said, yes, go up and fight. The fact that he even asked is amazing because he was a mighty warrior, had all these mighty men of God, and he said, go up, so he did it. And then later, he has trouble with them again, and what does he do? Instead of just charging in there, I've done this before, I know how to do this, he asks, he says, should I go up, should I go fight? And and the Lord says, no, wait, no, wait, until you hear the rustling in the mulberry trees, and, and then so he just, he's faithful, he listens, what should I do, Lord? And he listens to God. He does it with him. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus said that, not me. All of our best laid plans, all of the things that we think that we can do on our own, apart from him, we can do nothing. But what did he say about you in his word? Philippians 4 verse 13 in the New King James, I can do all things, somebody say all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then in Romans 8, 37, in the New King James, he says, yet in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he says that you can do all things and that you are more than a conqueror. Who are you to fear? He is the one who comforts you, the God of the breakthrough. Amen? Do you remember uh, Peter, the story about when Peter got out of the boat and because Jesus was walking on the water toward them and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, come. So Peter, an amazing act of faith, Peter gets out of the boat and he starts to walk on the water. When he looked at the waves, when he paid attention to the wind, when he paid attention to the circumstances that were around him, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he fell. Jesus rescued him, but it was an unnecessary rescue. When Peter had his eyes on Jesus, anything was possible. When he looked at the waves, he realized his own limitations. When we are in the word, spending time with him, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, anything is possible, amen? Hallelujah, second, second Corinthians, last verse, second Corinthians one verse 20 in the New King James. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, 
and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. All of his promises, everything that he said about you, to you, who you are, all of his promises are yes and amen. Hallelujah. I'm enjoying a second, second existence with Jesus because I died with him. Because I died with Jesus, I'm enjoying a second existence with Jesus, and he's just using my body. Amen. He is the God of the breakthrough. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, eyes closed. We don't want to let a service pass without giving an opportunity for you to know the God of the breakthrough. If you don't know him, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know that if you died tonight, you can know. Or if you do know him, but you haven't been serving him like you would and you'd like to rededicate your life to him, or if you've not been baptized in the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and you want to be, with no one looking around, if that's you on any one of these things, go ahead and just raise your hand real quick. I just want to see that. We'll say a prayer. I want to pray with you if that's you anywhere here. Praise God. Maybe someone online. Hallelujah. I think it's good for all of us to say, just go ahead and raise one hand. Father God, I ask you to forgive me. I believe that your son Jesus died for me and rose again so that I may be forgiven. I receive you and acknowledge you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Amen.